It's our first fall Zoom gathering, as you may be able to see. <laughs> and I'm really, really happy to have our panelists here and very happy to have our audience here as well on Zoom. Uh, my name is Joy Connolly, as you can see from my Zoom box. I am honored to serve as president of the American Council of Learned Societies, a role that I've played since uh, 2019. Um, so I'm I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I want to start by by thanking the MacArthur Foundation for their support of this panel. Uh, we're grateful to have their support to help us amplify this important event on this um, on a, a crucial topic, as I'll explain in a moment. Um, let me give you an outline, all of you um, attending by Zoom today, an outline of our plan for the next hour and a half. And let me reassure you, we have a practice at ACLS of ceasing promptly at 5.30 at the at, at the agreed upon time. Um, so we will let you get on with your lives. But until then, you're going to be, I think, gripped by this discussion. Um, I'm going to first just say a word about the speakers because you did briefly see a little description of them um, as you logged on at, at four, or just a minute after four. Um, but I'll say a, a, a extremely brief word about each of them with their permission, because uh, we all know you're really here to hear them talk, not to listen to me talk about them. And then I'm going to say a few words to set up the event today and explain a bit about why we're, we're talking about um, this, uh, this topic um, of uh, the faculty reward system and, and what counts. So um, as I said, um, a, a word of introduction. Uh, Monica Martinez is an associate professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. She won her MacArthur Fellowship in 2021. Um, she works on racial violence along the Texas-Mexico border. She's documenting descendants' efforts to commemorate and seek justice for the lives lost in that violence. Um, she's working on a digital archive. And this I underline because I think it will play a role in our conversation as we, uh, I mean, I know it will, as we talk about the reward system and the forms of work, of scholarly work that get, get rewarded uh, and those that don't. Um, I would also underline about Mon Monica's work, which I'm sure will also come up in our conversation as well, um, that it's of, of deep public interest. Um, it's about forms of violence targeting racial and ethnic groups um, between uh, you know a century ago, between 1900 and 1930, but you know ever present in the ways we think about our our lives and interactions today. So those issues of, of digital knowledge and public knowledge, public interest, uh, again, will resurface. I'm also very happy to introduce uh, Natalia Molina, Distinguished Professor of American Studies and Ethnicity and the Dean's Professor of American Studies and Ethnicity at USC, the University of Southern California. She's a 2020 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, and her work reveals how narratives of racial difference that were you know, designed for and applied to immigrant groups a long time ago, a century ago, um, continue to shape national policy, and I'll dare to say uh, culture and expectations in society today. Um, at the uh, at the time of her award, uh, and I know progress has been made. Natalia was working on two book projects, and I had the great honor and um, and real delight to hear her speak um, at a conference earlier this year, uh, where she de described her work at the restaurants of Los Angeles and the ways in which uh, uh, the Mexican restaurants in particular, brought people together across ethnicity, across class, forged community bonds, um, were really mainstays of community identity and interaction. And it was a fascinating talk and brilliantly illustrated with a, a extremely evocative photographs. I'll never forget it. It was a really uh, amazing presentation. And finally, uh, Dimitri Nikasas, a professor of classics at the University of Colorado Boulder, he won his MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2015. Um, Dimitri is really a, a, a broad thinker across philology and archaeology, social and economic theory and history. And he's been challenging ideas scholars have held for a long time about a particular uh, slice of, uh, of, of ancient Greek or maybe Dimitri would say pre-Greek uh, Mycenaean society in the Mediterranean, um, arguing uh, in, in, uh, through, uh, through archaeological surveys and technical work, which will come up in our conversation, I know, uh, that uh, uh, for a really a reconceived view of the way these, this society worked in the ancient Mediterranean context, which caught the attention of many pe people in my field, I'm honored to say that, um, that I too, um, as a scholar of ancient Roman political thought, 
um, an activity and, and you know, broadly connected to Dimitri. And I, I consider that a great honor. So um, as I said, I want to underline in, in his work um, that the issue of technical work and collaborative work, these are going to come up in our discussion. So again, um, I could go on and on, but I'm going to turn to, uh, for a few minutes, the topic of our discussion um, so that I can explain why a group like ACLS, the American Council of Learned Societies, would um, would would feature this conversation and why we're so invested in it, why we're so really on fire about this this issue of the faculty reward structure, which might sound, especially for those of you, um, you know, uh, on, on the borders of academia or outside it, um, not, not like the most burning issue, but I hope that my introduction will explain why we think it is. And, and I know that our conversation in a few minutes will, um, will convince you. So, um, so where are we coming from? I, I'll put it this way. And in our pre, um, in our pre event conversation, which, which we held, um, uh, a couple of weeks back, um, we, we all agreed, the group of us, that, um, the way to start uh, getting into this issue was to think about, um, and reflect on for a minute together how higher education can both feel like and really be and function as, um, a thing of, of paradoxes and contradictions. Um, it's not even, I think I may have used the phrase, higher education system. And one could even say it's not even a system, that the paradox, the contradiction rests there, that higher education, and I'm now quoting uh, old ACLS friend John Kutzko, who used to serve as the executive director of the Society for Biblical Literature. John used to say um, that higher education is a systemless system. It functions like a system when you don't want it to, and when you really do want it to function as a system, it doesn't. It's fragmented, it's competitive, it's isolating in all the wrong ways and for the wrong reasons and with the wrong outcomes. Uh, uh, and, uh, and and again, that's uh, that it, that's the landscape we're we're living in. Well, what, one example of a, a concrete example, the one we'll be talking about today of the contradiction-riven nature of higher education or academia is the faculty reward structure. And I want to be clear here that we're talking about the faculty reward structure in American research universities and in some elite, elite liberal arts colleges that um, that pitch themselves and that are um, havens for, for outstanding research. Um, this is not to say that great research and scholarship doesn't go on um, in other sectors of American higher education, that it, in fact, it goes on in research libraries and it goes on outside academia and outside systems altogether. But we're talking here specifically about um, about faculty whom I might say have been uh, the main audience and the main mainstay of ACLS activity, scholarly activity for the last century and more. And that is, again, faculty producing scholarship um, many of them working in, re in, in in universities that describe themselves as research active or highly research active um, and uh, liberal arts colleges as well. So in that in that structure, in that re in the reward structure, um, in that uh, in that type of uh, or I should say in those types of institutions, you can, faculty are told this, and this is really, again, I'm trying to get across the, the, um, the nature of this contradiction. Faculty, faculty are told, told all the time, innovate, experiment. Okay, they're told, do careful, accurate, culturally sensitive, technically sophisticated work. They're told, reach the public. Okay, they're told all these things. And putting the, all those things, line, you know, lining all those things up, you can hear how they bump up against one another, push, push against each other. You can guess at the contradictions. But let me just, you know, let me dig into one of those examples. Innovate. You'll hear deans and administrators and provosts and presidents and boards of trustees and legislators talk proudly all the time about their innovative faculty um, and how they're really pushing the boundaries. But in most humanistic fields, you have to write your book or you won't get hired, you won't get tenured, you won't get promoted. Okay, that's the reward system that evaluates work, um, a book, uh, uh, and, and requires typically a book uh, for uh, a book in the making to get a job, a book published to get tenure, a second book in the making or published to get promoted. That's the kind of basic building blocks of the reward system that we're talking about here in the research university and the well-resourced um, research-focused liberal arts college. Now, there's nothing wrong with books. We love books at ACLS. 
people I'm talking to here are written, are writing books, have written books. I have written books. They're wonderful technology and we're going to continue to supporting them for as far as the eye can see, certainly through my lifetime and well beyond. But they're also an old technology and they're not the only technology. So I mentioned digital archives a few minutes ago. Uh, that's one of the, the many modes of knowledge circulation that exists today. And, and you might also think of others, um, digital archives, podcasts, also things that are not things you can hold in your hand or look at on the internet, things like community activities, um, exhibits, things that have a different kind of expression and, and different kind of um, time frame. So, so that's, this is a, a really good example of the ways of, of the paradoxes and contradictions that we want to try to get at today, that the structures that were designed for good reasons, that still serve some good functions, um, that, but, but that at the same time can hold people back, seek to put people in boxes. We hear very often at ACLS, uh, from, from really brilliant, uh, brilliant scholars at all stages, uh, of career that they're either being told or they're telling uh, emerging scholars, that's a great idea. You've got a great project in mind, but you know, wait till you get your job and get tenure because you've got to write that book first, and then you can do that great work. And we hear that, and our hearts sink because we believe we can do better, and that by thinking together um, about changing norms in a way that. Uh, that's that's acceptable, that meets uh, the scholarly values and aspirations we want to set for one another and for ourselves, um, that we're going to end up in an academia that's um, even better than it is now. So I could go on and on, but let me just say, I, I hope I've set the the, um, the scene uh, with that uh, and, and explained our, our investment in this activity at ACLS. Our mission is to advance and strengthen humanistic scholarship. We think by broadening the field and opening up norms will help do that. And we have collected these three people who have given incredibly generously of their time and energy to talk about their own experience and lead us through um, lead us through their own experience and dig into some of these issues. So I'm going to start out by asking them each to talk for about five minutes um, about their own experience, uh, about their maybe their pre-MacArthur and post-MacArthur experience if they choose to configure it that way, but I'm going to leave it to them. Um, I have a couple follow-up questions. We're going to encourage conversation among them. This, these kinds of events always work best when, when they flow uh, fairly informally. But just keep in mind, audience members, that by about five o'clock, um, I'll be looking to open it up to questions from you. We may, we may go to you earlier if we see a lot of questions before that piling up. Um, please put the questions in the Q&A. Um, don't use the chat. Please use the Q&A function. It's a lot easier for us to monitor just one channel. So we'll be focusing on the Q&A. Um, and just keep in mind that five o'clock uh, time as the time we'll be looking at to turn to you. But don't uh, don't hesitate. Don't hold back if you want to uh, to put the questions in now, you know, starting now. We're going to be keeping an eye on them and, and we'll avoid having them pile up. So I'm going to start. Um, I believe with Monica, please take it away. Thank you so much, Joy. And thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be in such esteemed company and so grateful um, for the ACLS for, for having this conversation, which is, as you pointed out, quite critical. Um, we are certainly, I'm zooming in from Austin, Texas and, um, um, it, you know, the, the, the need for, um, scholars to have public facing work to think about their public impact is so urgent and the dynamics <laughs> um, that are at play are also um, changing rapidly, even since I made the decision to, to move to Texas um, to, to leave Brown University and come to UT Austin. Um, you know, that was in, in 2020. And wow, you know, the uh, legislation has changed across, not just in Texas, but across the country. And so really the environment feels um, different than the environment that uh, I was recruited to come and join. Um, but I'll say that so I'm glad to be having this conversation and to learn to think together. Um, in terms of my uh, relationship or, you know, one of the questions that we thought collaboratively about is, you know, how uh, the, uh, the reward system or metrics align with um, some of the public facing work that I've been able to do. You know, I've always from mentors who 
practiced in public history and practiced in public humanities um, and trained me and other students to to uh, to contribute to contribute publicly through our research and scholarship um, was was the sort of rule of thumb was the the books will get you the job and promotion and so everything else is like icing <laughs> so for your file all of that extra public facing work really is not going to count um, it will count if it leads to an award. Um, and I also learned this was not something that I was, uh, uh, that really I had mentors talk to me about, um, until I was an assistant professor and, um, uh, you know, trying to finish my book, but also working on public projects with collaborators. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, was really when there was press coverage. So an exhibit at the Bullock Texas State History Museum, for example, um, in 2016, it was a temporary exhibit. It was up. 10 weeks only, but almost 50,000 people came to see the exhibit. It was the first time that a state institution in Texas was acknowledging a period of state sanctioned racial violence in the early 20th century, um, violence that was called for by governors and elected officials um, and also by local residents. And so it was a, a really, um, it was a monumental event um, and and so pivotal, I think, for public education, creating an opportunity for people to come and learn about that history at a state institution, um, but also it was a learning opportunity what we found from journalists um, who realized that they had not had opportunities themselves to learn about these histories and the historical events that they learned about at the museum helped them understand issues today surrounding immigration and policing. Um, and so really it became for me early in my career as, a, as an assistant professor, realizing the possibilities to, to, to contribute to public education as a historian by partnering with museums, um, but also by, you know, engaging the press and, and, and giving interviews to the press. Um, and so for me, the, uh, I had to, to be quite savvy. Um, and what I realized is that receiving grants and fellowships that helped me um, with course buyouts actually helped me do two things. So, you know, I was also encouraged to think about the multiple lives of research. So the research and the scholarship that allows you to write the book um, can have other lives. And so when I had, for example, um, a Carnegie fellowship that allowed me time away out of the classroom to finish writing the book, but also to, to contribute time to the public facing work and to develop a research lab of and train graduate students at Brown University and undergraduate students that could help me with the digital work. And so it was the sort of multitasking that I was allowed to do uh, with um, having time outside of the classroom uh, that I was really able to utilize. Um, but not all fellowships uh, think about, you know, what time faculty have um, can contribute to projects other than the book. And so I have seen other scholars do that. And, and I'll also say that I had to do, you know, the skills that I learned as a graduate student and as an assistant professor um, uh, only helped me get so far in the public facing work. It really required coordination and collaboration. So um, I did help, uh, I co-founded a nonprofit uh, educational nonprofit called Refusing to Forget um, with my colleagues, John Moran Gonzalez and Ben Johnson, Trinidad Gonzalez, and Sonia Hernandez um, in 2014. And that helped also for us to collaborate and coordinate in applying for grants that could support the public work. Um, and so funding from the AHA or from the NEH helped us to bring some of those projects to fruition um, that would not that, you know, we weren't finding support for the public facing projects from our universities. And so I think the sort of takeaway from my experience has always been that the public facing work is in addition to the regular research or teaching, unless you can get time away from the classroom. Um, and also that the reward structure didn't acknowledge that public facing work um, until after the impact was seen, awards came in. And then also, uh, you know, I didn't, I'm still learning about how universities um, appreciate and acknowledge uh, media coverage. And every time that a university's name is in a, is in a newspaper, um, that there are teams of people at universities that are counting, and that that is something that doesn't uh, align with 
rewards or metrics uh, for review necessarily, but it, it's it's a part of the the calculus. Thank you so much. That's incredible and t- a lot to think about. I've been taking notes uh, with a lot of keywords, so we'll come back to them. Um, thank you, uh, Natalia. Please take it over. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, ACLS, for having us. I feel that these are conversations that we're often having at the bars, at conferences, or you know, over lunch or coffee when we go visit a campus. And so I feel like you're bringing these discussions into the light where they should be. Um, And it's also really important for this to be a conversation with people from different departments, different disciplines, and different universities. Because what I have found is that you need both the specificity and experience of your university but you need people from outside of your university to say there is another way. Um, you know, what what are other ways that that your university could be providing grants or having different metrics? And these things also change. I won't even, I'm a historian, I won't even say over time, they can change almost year to year um, sometimes, right? Like uh tenure and promotion panels um, you know, get turned over, provosts leave. You know, pre- new presidents are elected, new, dem- you know, new um, political parties are in power and affect legislation. So these things are rapidly changing. So we really need to keep our fingers on the pulse of it. I want to speak a little bit about service here, um, because I think that one message that we might co- that the message that is traditionally given around then, you know, around one count and get your book done is just say no to service or, you know, say minimal service, you know, just do minimal service or your department should protect junior faculty. And one, some departments do protect junior faculty to some extent, some don't, um, depends often on the resources, but then also what happens once those folks aren't junior faculty, right? You still need to to figure out, give people the skills to deal with these things. And it's no longer just departments that are making these asks. It's all, you're getting all kinds of asks from outside the university. Um, I remember when I was a study director in Granada, Spain, it's, you know, email, email was already invented, (laughs) but it wasn't what it is now um, where people are like emailing all the time or texting or, that kind of thing. I used to just tell my students, if you want me to read anything, I'm happy to while I'm awake, just mail it to me. And that way people could be thoughtful in their intentions. But what I'm seeing with, um, what I've, in my experience with service, and I have had a, a bit of a hybrid career, you know, kind of half of it administrative and half of it as a scholar. Um, but what I've enjoyed about that is I like to know how things work. So while it's admin or service, I see service as a way to understand the structure so that we can see what counts and help make that system more transparent for others. Um, even though, you know, I was in a system for a long time that was very transparent, the University of California system, and we had a manual and it explained things and it was so technical that our letter writers would complain. Um, even in those situations, of course, subjectivity comes into, into play because not only is higher ed not a system, but even something like the UC system is not a system. And we see this in our own universities where even divisions have different standards or different ways of interpreting things. And so um, understanding that system and asking people to be accountable for those systems is really important and helping them see, bring things into alignment. There are the goals of a department and what people get hired um, to do in that department. There are the goals of the division there are goals of the university. And then there's also that public conversation, that community connection. And it's helping that university say, when you say that we represent X, we're not in alignment here because our review policies don't support that. Either that work doesn't count or our faculty actually have to leave the university to do this kind of work. Um, I had the the pleasure and the privilege of being the interim research director at the Huntington Library last year. And 
one of the reasons that everybody loves the Huntington is not just because of, you know, the time off sabbatical. And we do have ACLS scholars that, that go there and that are affiliated with the Huntington. It's that they get to talk to other professors. They get to learn from one another. You know, how often are we on campus and we're just running around from one thing to another, trying to stay on top of those things or trying not to get too behind and yet not actually talking to each other. So ironically, the university doesn't become a space of learning for us oftentimes. And until we think of not just reward structures, but growth structures, both in terms of offering opportunities for conversation with one another, for sharing work, for uh, innovating our teaching. I mean, I think about how my teaching has changed. I used to show up with a transparency and a, and a and a piece of chalk, you know, just figuring out the PowerPoints and sending them to the students and um, the, the videos that we show and the inside out classroom and the field trip and connecting them to scholars outside. And that means, of course, I'm going to call Monica and say, can you come to my classroom? And she's going to say, can you come to mine? And all of a sudden now all our work has been amplified. So it's really like, if you want that innovation, structure it, do a small grant, do something where somebody can co-teach, do something where there's an institute and somebody gets some research funds, actually reward the things that we want professors to do. And don't make them spend six months out of the year applying for fellowships so that they can do the innovative innovative work that reflects well on the university. Thank you. And I especially appreciate Natalia, and I'll just pull this out in case we come back to it later. Although there, I mean, both of you have said many things already. We're, <laughs> we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, but the, the ways in which the reward structure and, and the, and the incentives put in place, uh, go far beyond the simple example I started with, you know, a, a book versus other forms of output that really go to the way we spend our time every single day, day after day, week after week, um, and and the things that we don't get to do uh, as uh, because we're we're taken up with, as you said, rushing around campus. So thank you for for reframing it in that way, um, Dimitri. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks again. I want to reiterate my thanks to Joy and ACLS for sponsoring this um, this event. And uh, I apologize in advance if I sound very echoey. I'm coming to you from Athens. It's almost midnight here, and I'm in a very echoey map room, so I have access to good internet. Um, so that's the reason for that. Um, yeah, everything that has been said just really resonates with me. Um, one thing that I've thought a lot about is... Um, you know, I'm an, I'm an archaeologist in a classics department, and um, so that means um, I'm almost, well, there's kind of social science-y nature to the work that I do, in that um, archaeology tends to be less about books. Um, the books that it does produce are often of a highly technical nature, um, and it's more focused on field work. And, you know, field work, in a way can show up really well on the CV if, uh, in terms of the reward structures, if you've been getting a lot of external grants, you know, big money external grants, universities always perk up about that. Um, but it also can get in the way, get in the way of um, producing things that are going to guarantee you um, tenure and promotion. So one thing that I thought a lot about is the way that um, classics departments, like many humanities departments, want a book. Um, specifically, they want a book of a certain type. They want a book that's published by a certain kind of press. And those presses, um, you know, uh, may or may not be interested in the kinds of um, work that, as, an, as a junior faculty member, you're well equipped to produce. So, for example, you know, big university presses in the United States used to publish um, Kind of technical archaeological work. And they're no longer interested in that. And so what you end up, well, at least what I observe is that a lot of people end up writing books that don't move the field forward, that don't actually bring the full brunt of their intellectual capabilities to bear because they're being asked to write a book of a different sort, right? A book that's not aimed at the public but also not aimed at a very small, 
coterie of archaeologists, but is kind of like mid-range between those two. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of thing, I think, um, stifles um, innovation, if you want. It prevents the field from moving forward. Um, and, the, and part of the reason for that, I think, is this, um, you know, in addition to that I think uh, Monica was talking about, that um, if you're kind of uh, orbiting the core of a discipline, as I sometimes feel as uh, I am as an archaeologist in the classics department, um, a lot of stuff that you need to do is seen as extra and additional. And like, yeah, that's kind of your problem and you have to deal with it. You know, so even little things like as a grad student, having to learn things on the fly in the field, because, you know, I had to take like, <laughs> you have to take classes in Greek and Latin literature. And like, that's what you need to do to get a job. And no one's going to, you know, so these kind of technical skills that actually enrich your research are not things that are seen as useful um, by the discipline. And then the, the other thing I sort of wanted to think about, too, was this um Something I think Joy mentioned about being put into uh, putting being put into a box. Um, a lot of my friends who are extremely intelligent and offer a lot to the field, um, but who haven't advanced in their careers are, are really eclectic. They're uh, eclectic thinkers. They're eclectic scholars. It's hard to put their work into a box. Um, you know, that's part of the fun of academia is that you get to do <laughs> different things, and um, and the reward structures don't typically um, um, I don't want to say reward reward yeah whatever reward structures don't hold for that um, so there's a there's a tendency to you know you want to sort of want to double down um, on whatever you're good at so that you become yeah you know the premier Roman historian in America or you become the premier um, yeah, scholar of, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, of any particular subcategory. And so then we end up in the situation, yeah, where we become increasingly narrow. The thing that, that brings us joy, or at least the thing that brought me joy in graduate school was being exposed to all kinds of different ideas. The joy of the university is being exposed to different ideas. And then, um, and then uh, we're, not, um, we're not encouraged to follow up on that. We're encouraged to just to keep banging away on the same drum. Um, is that five minutes? I think maybe I should leave it there. Thanks, Dimitri. I, and I, I want to tie together what you said just now about, um, about specialization and, and, um, and not just specialization. I mean, none of these things, again, I, I, I want to be really clear. I mean, none of these things are are bad in of themselves, you know. I mean, specialization is key. It's how we push forward. It's it's the ways in which um, specialization uh, becomes a, a a privileged measure to the degree that other things that are also needed to keep the system working fall off the grid. Um, or maybe that's the wrong way to put it. The work that, as you said. Um, someone venturing into another subfield um, in that eclectic mode um, finds that they don't get through the that that work doesn't get caught up in the reward filter because it represents a different strand of thinking that for reasons that um, increasingly I think people are finding irrational um, it doesn't follow the very narrow trajectory mapped out as the ideal for the best in a particular subfield as as so it's another just another way of putting what you were, you were saying. Um, together um, with um, with where we started, so I want to I want to raise um, an issue that's come up in different ways in in everything in in, in what each of you have said, and um, and that's uh, the particular challenges and and uh, not to sound like a cliche, but the challenges and opportunities really pointed. I think both challenges and opportunities today when it comes to public. Scholarship and and you know I think you use the phrase um, Monica public facing work. Um, I see we've already had a question actually about defining the nature of the public. We could we could follow that up um, as well. But 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 thinking specifically 
I, I, we could go in a number of directions. I'm going to throw it open to all of you. I mean, we could talk about how doctoral education does or doesn't prepare people to do public scholarship. We could talk about the particular challenges, the obstacles that public scholarship runs into. And I think people in the audience would love to hear. Um, I think especially Monica and Natalia, you've threaded the needle in getting um, the work that is maybe the spinoff or the run-up or the parallel work to the published book, um, getting that recognized and rewarded as well. Um, and, and lastly, I think we could, uh, I, I don't want to ignore, I think, um, Monica, you, you brought this up at the beginning, the political angle to this, because the, when we put together issues of public interest in the polarized political landscape in which, in which we live, um, it, you know, things get even more heated up. So I'm op- I'm intentionally clearing a wide field and inviting you to jump in, and we'll we'll talk about this for the next few minutes. And I've avoided calling on anyone. I'll, I'll start it off um, just by talking a little bit about. Um, I'll follow up on, on Monica when she talked about uh, the multiple lives of research, which is such a beautiful way to think of it, um, which is something that we're not really trained to do. And again, this, like Dimitri says, like you kind of need to learn it along the way. Um, this is one of those things that I think for me, I was able to learn it by working with K through 12 teachers. And it was the kind of thing that I did on my own also um, because there was a financial reward, you know, during the summers um, at, you know, I both found it rewarding and it was nice that it was actually rewarded. <laughs> um, but I just learned so much about just seeing that teachers were always, you know, looking to innovate, looking to get their students the best uh, cutting research, cutting edge research, but also they, because they're so busy, needed to hit the ground running. They needed to really be able to apply that knowledge. Um, and then seeing that we're kind of just taught about the book and less about the afterlives. And so for me, one of the ways that um, I've been able to work on that is by doing curriculum for my books. And, but even that, well, I'll say curriculum. So I'll explain some of it. So um, I've read on, you know, on public health, immigration, and now the project that you just, that you described, Joy, and thinking about cities and immigrants as placemakers and restaurants as urban anchors and trying to use GIS mapping and mapping and everything to, to amplify that. Those are things that then I needed to partner with people to amplify that. So both with our, you know, teaching institutions on my campus. But what I also saw, it's at moments of, and now with Gilder Lerman um, for the immigration research and now uh, the, the placemaking research um, curriculum. But I also saw that so many people did that during uh, moments of crisis, uh, during 9-11, right? Having a shared syllabus, uh, Black, Li- Black Lives Matter, having a shared syllabus, the pandemic in terms of thinking about disease and the, the social impacts of it or anti-Asian racism. And I think it's really telling that it's in these moments of crisis that people are coming together versus imagine how generative that work can be if it be, was part of our regular practice. Even just, um, you know, you see conferences trying to innovate with this was saying like, we don't just have to keep reading papers. And I was the co-chair of the Organization of American Historians Conference, I believe in uh, 2020 or 2021, 2021. And it was like, even though we had it in the call for papers, we could talk to one another. You can turn in a working paper. You can do all these things. We are, we so internalize this that it's one, difficult to get out of that mode. And two, we're not used to sharing unless something is perfect. And we need to also make space for imperfection. We need to make space for conversation. And that is part of that. When we talk about the public, we often think about like op-eds um, or, you know, um, a museum exhibit. But the public is also just sharing our work in ways that 
is about moving it forward. You know, and this is a little, this goes back a little bit to Dimitri's point is not only are we supposed to be specialists when we publish, we're supposed to be specialists every time we speak, you know, and yet how do you actually then, then grow if you're never at your growth edge? Um, so we need to make space for that as well. Thank you, Nathalia. I'll just join by sharing. And I think that that joy coming to the question about who's the public is is really useful here, because I, I think on the one hand, the sort of public, I think universities, um, are, there's a big push to get faculty to write op-eds, right, to be public facing in that way. And, you know, I see that as, you know, speaking to the public, reaching audiences outside of the classroom. But that to me is not engaged public scholarship. Um, that's diff you know, th as somebody who's who's trained in public humanities and teaches students uh, the methods of public humanities, you know, central to that question is who is the public and how is the public engaged in the conversation about goals for public, you know, public work, public projects. And so, especially with my colleagues in refusing to forget, you know, when we were asking like, what does restorative work look like to try to repair. Um, the long impacts of racial violence on generations of people living in Texas, um, we had to have descendants in the room. And, and they were the ones that said, you know, we've been memorializing our loved ones on our own for a long time. It's time for the state to be involved. And so that really shifted our work to then think about, okay, let's collaborating with state institutions like the Texas Historical Commission or the Bullock Texas State History Museum. Um, and so, and, you know, I think about people like Margaret Burnham, uh, who leads the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project um, out of Northeastern's School of Law, that when they're thinking about restorative justice work, they're also asking descendants, you know, who who had loved ones that were lynched or that were murdered by police, what does healing look like? And so it might be a historical marker, it might be an apology, um, but that kind of engaged conversation is something that I think universities still really struggle to understand. I mean, they still sort of understand that as academics, we're the intellectuals, we're the scholars, we are the ones with the answers. Um, and it's a different conversation to say, let's engage the, the public in thinking about what a public project might look like. Um, and again, to think about the goals. I'll also say that as a historian, you know, I was trained I, in graduate school, I certainly heard from historians that said, you know, go to the go to the stacks in the library and read the footnotes and find the debates that historians are having and find where you can interject. And so I certainly had some of that mentoring, but I also had mentoring from people like Matt Garcia and Vicky Ruiz, who said, you know, if you're going to be an engaged historian, uh, you're going to have you can't just go to the archives, you know, at the at the state archives. You can't just go to the to the university archives. You're going to have to go to the community and conduct oral histories for, for marginalized communities whose histories have not been preserved and documented. You actually have to help build the archive to then analyze it. And so that also taught me, they also taught me the practice of sharing back, you know, the sort of ethics of preserving these histories, documenting these histories, and then writing about them and not sharing back those archives and thinking about, you know, a museum exhibit being one way of sharing back. Digital archives as being a really important way. You know, the Smithsonian's oral history project on the Bracero project is one of the sort of model projects um, uh, uh, for helping to build a uh, uh, to, to remedy an institutional gap and neglect um, with an oral history archive, documents, photographs. Um, but that but that work is is often, I think, by foundations and universities unseen, right? The work of scholars that have to go and do the research, build the archives before they can start to write um, is something that then adds, you know, the 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 conversations with the public are, are integral to the work. And, and I think it, it still is hard for some people to grasp the labor that goes into that, both beginning, you know, middle and end. And what the ending looks like can be more than just the book. It's certainly one of those, um, what you're both are saying, it's, it's one of those uh, trains of thought that make it so clear that the question, what is the deliverable? Is, is a question that, uh, you know, either doesn't fit at all or really needs to be modified if it's going to make any kind of sense in trying to measure, um, a work, uh, or, or a proposal for a grant, um, or a, um, or, or think about, you know, how to count up, 
um, interventions that count for um, for hiring or promotion or tenure. Thank you for that. Um, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, you know, is to share that 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 the public work. And this is, you know, something that I share with my students all the time, the graduate students that want to go into the academy, you know, because they feel this pull or this impulse to do the public work now. And I say, you know, now is about developing the skills and doing the research and making sure that your scholarship is stellar. And, and that sort of commitment to the scholarship is what really undergirds the public projects. And, and I think that that can't be missed either in, in the conversation. Well, I think I, I'm going to ask a, um, a a question, I think, for Dimitri primarily, and then you can weigh in. And I'm going to turn pretty quickly, though, to um, to the questions building up in the Q&A, because they're really interesting. And my, my question is, is it, I mean, it is pulling uh, pulling some on some threads that that both um, you, you have mentioned, Monica and Natalia, but, um, but leaning particularly on um, on the the fact that especially when we're doing community engaged or publicly engaged or public facing research, but not only then, we um, often aren't doing it alone. We're either I mean, you you mentioned advisors and people giving you advice. There are community participants and and fellow people, you know, fellow um, uh, conversationalists. In the and in, in Natalia, I love the way you talked about making space for conversation itself as an as a um, as a goal. Uh, but but this is all these are plural multiple uh, multiple people are involved in these activities so um Dimitri thinking about you as an archaeologist you work with teams you work with you know with many people how do you see that um that fact that plurality the the multiplicity of people uh, interacting with the reward system as we currently have it today yeah um it's something that um struck me because when I won the MacArthur, I was in the middle of putting together this archaeological project and I was sort of turning into a, a football coach with like like high school foot coach, co football coach with like weird platitudes about the team, but I, which I really, you know, believe um, and, you know, trying to get, you know, I think what, what makes a great project are the graduate students, at least, um, or, you know, people at that level. Um, where they they're they're really they're learning, but they also have a ton to contribute and new ideas, right? That they're the ones that are going to power any project. And really, my role is just to make their job easier and get out of the way and try not to try not to ruin um, the good work that they're doing. And um, and yeah, there is a kind of heroic mode of scholarship that is um, implicit in older works in archaeology. My friend Bill Gerhard likes to call it the heroic mode of archaeology. You know, I think to a certain extent, MacArthur also is premised on a kind of heroic mode of scholarship, right? It's, it's awarded to a single person. And, um, yeah, that made me feel deeply uncomfortable, to be perfectly honest. Um, and it's just the nature, I think, of a lot of um, work um, across the academy that um, our specializations are becoming... Um, so specific that it becomes very difficult for any one person to control everything. So, you know, our archaeological project was diachronic. It was a landscape project. So we had um, we had ethnographers, we had geomorphologists, we had um, historians, um, archaeologists. Um, all, so people coming in yeah, from very different um, points of view and. It's difficult to, um, I think it can, be, it can be difficult to communicate the way in which projects like that really are more than just the sum of the parts or some, you know, just a bunch of names on, a, on a, in sort of in ranked order, you know, from like the most senior person on the project to the least senior person on the project. Um, you know, the extent to which graduate students are looped in on publication really varies quite widely um, and wildly in the, in the discipline. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I think there, there is a, um, a difficulty in the, the, that these, these projects, these, these teams of scholars, really what, what gets counted is this kind of like, yeah, output, as we say, you know, like, uh, and then, you know, even to the point where people going up for tenure and promotion are asked to like, 
say what percentage they contributed, you know, to, 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 to a multi-author. This is another thing, right? It's like, it's very difficult sometimes in the humanities to, um, to explain what a multi-author <laughs> article actually means in practice, you know? Um, and it's, it's not often about contributing words, but it's, it, could, it can be about contributing, um, you know, data, um, or, or other kinds of, other kinds of labor. Um, that are that are really important, but just don't manifest themselves in kind of traditional ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, I see what I do as being highly collaborative, even projects that aren't highly collaborative. Like I like you know just talking to people, you know, and like looking at the acknowledgments. I think and, and sometimes it's really um, telling, and the, and you sort of see certain people's names appearing over and over and over again, you know. Um, but yeah, so I think it. Um, I think it can be difficult to communicate um, to a to a to a to institutions that value kind of individual contributions. You know, to try to um, explain what it means to be part of the team, and which is strange, right? Because you know, this is not like it's not like. <laughs> You know, this is not like a, a specific problem to us. I mean, it's a the natural sciences are also team team based um, um, research, right? And so, um, yeah, it's not it's not just a humanities and social sciences kind of issue. No, it really isn't. And I and I want to call out the efforts of, um, I mean, in a good way. I want to lift up to everybody's attention the efforts of a group called Humetrics, um, which is based at Michigan State, and it's trying through, um, I shouldn't say trying, it it is developing uh, with an with an emphasis on uh, promotion and tenure files, and and I think they would extend this to job applications too, and other forms of the ways we evaluate students and, 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 and scholars as they evolve over their careers, um, focusing on narrative, on storytelling, rather than um, points on a CV. And uh, when and uh, it, this is one of the moments where, in, in talking about this, as I said at the beginning, some, sometimes you know, people say to me, you know, this is so nuts and bolts, this is so nitty gritty, like how boring is this to talk about a CV versus a narrative for uh, for a job application or or a tenure review? But but, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, if we can't get this right, then we're going to be holding back um, work that um, and contributions, you know, that otherwise go, in, you know, become invisible. So it's with, with that in mind that um, thinking about kind of the practical implications of, of some of the, the issues and, and situations you've put on the table, um, I'm looking at a question uh, raised by Victoria Zabo in the Q&A about the feasibility um, of having the same body of research, as she puts it, find expression in both the more traditional monograph or article form and also in more public scholarship without it being truly double the work. Um, she says, uh, picking up on, uh, I think, something you said, Monica, that it seems like maybe the digital supplement to the book or article could be a middle ground here. But do you see that approach gaining a lot of traction? And I'm starting with this question from uh, from Victoria. Thank you for that. Um, because it's getting to the practical a little bit um, and will let us uh, move from the practical nuts and bolts um, to the big ideas and back again. But uh, but your thoughts on that? Do you see the the digital supplement or maybe public facing essay um, as something people could start getting their hands around as they um, as the as we try to make the system work well as a system and actually work justly as a system uh, in 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 this area? Thank you. That's a that's a great question. I mean, certainly, I think the digital opens up a whole uh, set of avenues. Um, and I have colleagues that have, you know, historians who've published books, and they have online, they have websites for their books that include, you know, access to primary sources, lesson plans, um, and resources that can be used not just by teachers, but by journalists and, and are a real resource um, for the book. Uh, for me, with mapping violence, it's a second research project. You know, I, I, in researching my first book, I, I kept finding so many cases of racial violence that had not been documented, and I couldn't write about them all. And I also started to see some patterns of association with, you know, 
the, an example of one law enforcement officer who was moving around the state as a Texas Ranger committing acts of racial violence. And so when I started to then say, you know, and then also finding out, you know, later in the research that he had started his career first by killing um, building a reputation for, for murdering African-American prisoners in his custody. And so the digital research project is a recovery project, but also util utilizes digital uh, tools for research and recovery, but also to study the work. And so, you know, it becomes this huge set, it, you know, this process of translating historical information into data. Um, and so thinking about studying space and using digital tools, not just to display what we have found, but also to, 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 to further our inquiry um, and to help us ask new questions. And so that work is, it requires, you know, training and developing new skills, developing teams of of students, but also collaborators. And then also thinking about, like, what are the restrictions at any one university for supporting these kinds of projects? Um, and so part of, you know, the work that I've done in developing relationship with Margaret Burnham, but also people, sociologist Jeff Ward, or we're just having these conversations about, you know, how do you build your digital project at your university and what kinds of grants might support not just our own individual projects, but our collective efforts to think about a national repository for these kinds of cases. And so for me, the digital, um, I think that universe, especially in the humanities, um, and the liberal arts are still figuring out how to support digital projects. And and to your po earlier point, Joy, and, and also to come back to Natalia's, um, you know, poignant recommendation is, you know, easy access to seed funding that can allow experimentation, that can allow growth. Um, and also, you know, for my own file for facing promotion as assistant professor, um, at, at, you know, saw that there that um, uh, in terms of applying for grants, um, that wasn't something that really counted, but it was in receiving grants, it was something that some of my reviewers were willing to say, that's like peer review. We can think about how to peer review digital scholarship projects, you know, having a, a panel, a grant uh, panel review this project, sort of thinking about it as like proof of concept. Um, and, and also seeing, you know, the American Historical Association, for example, um, and the Journal for American History is now reviewing exhibits and reviewing digital projects. And so I think it's taking creativity on a whole different set of levels um, for people to think about how to make these projects count and what peer review looks like for public facing work, but also digital scholarship. Thank you. Others, I'd welcome your comments if you'd like to jump in. The only thing I wanted to add was that something I noticed with a lot of seed grants that university, that was in my university, that there can be a tendency to like chase the money in a way that I find really problematic. That you know, like, oh, we'll, we'll see this, we'll give this money because we think it's going to get like an NEH, or we think it's going to get some other, you know, some a melon or something like that. And I don't understand. Um, Sorry, this is not the main point, but I, I just don't understand why we can't fund good research. Like, are we that, are we so um, insecure that we? I mean, you know, I understand that the sort of financial need, but there's also this kind of like need to to uh, to receive external validation. You know, as a university, like we're smart, can we figure out what are good projects and just give and give funding to those because we think it's good research? I mean, it just seems like um, it's another way in which the the incentives are all messed up. Sorry about that. No, I think I mean you're 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 coming at. I mean, this is driving a couple of the early questions, um, uh, and I'm looking at uh, and seeing Deborah McDowell's questions um, about a half an hour ago, where she was really putting on the table um, the question of how we understand the public, um, and and. I think the you know certainly what we hear at ACLS is that one of the challenges to to real change and concrete change su such that people coming after you you know wouldn't have to um, wouldn't necessarily experience the the the, um, the challenges and stresses that you did you know would find a smoother path for getting their work accepted you know recognized rewarded celebrated um, that one of the challenges to that is um, that. There's a, you know, now 
at least a century, you can stretch this number depending on the discipline, um, of disciplinary and, and interdisciplinary knowledge, depending on the field or, or interdisciplinary area uh, and experience when it comes to evaluating books and articles, but that that doesn't exist when it comes to evaluating other forms of work um, or evaluating the kinds of conversations that um, or processes that are integral to um, to the advancement of humanistic knowledge, but that are you know aren't captured in anything like you know even a digital archive, um, and and the challenge of uh, of, uh, of of creating guidelines, standards, norms for judging this work. Um, my colleague Mary Richter put in the chat earlier the um, the really useful guidelines by the AH, produced by the AHA and the MLA, the American Historical Association and the Modern Language Association. Um, other member associations uh, of, of ACLS have produced. Uh, similar guidelines, and I encourage everyone here today, um, in whatever discipline you are, you, to check out your your society or association. And if you don't see the guidelines or any mention of this there, you can bring it up because this is something that um, we're talking about at ACLS with all our member societies, the roles that they can play, given the realities of staffing and people power. Not, not everyone can turn on a dime and generate guidelines You know, in three months. It takes time and energy to do it well. Um, and I don't want to put more pressure on my already hardworking colleagues. But, you know, is this the way to go in your view? Um, primarily, are there, um, are there, uh, do you want to give a couple of shout outs or are there other ways in which to change the, the culture as well as the professional processes by which we judge work that you'd like to share thoughts on? I'll take one step back because as you were asking that great question, I started jotting down more <laughs> about the, the funding, but it is it is related to changing the work. And so just in terms of things that I've seen um, both at my university, my past university, when I review files, um, you know, one is in terms because I. I'm so in agreement with Dimitri. Like, I'm not sure why we're always asking people to apply for outside funding um, without first promoting and supporting that work in the university. And so a few ways that I've seen it is, um, you know, my university has a, a program to, it's apply for, I think it's, a you know, one of those NEH summer grants. And you do an internal competition first, but they actually give you feedback on your grant application. And so just the feedback alone is worth it, right? So that you're getting that peer review in your own university. The people that are reviewing it are also getting credit for being a peer reviewer. And so it's just making work visible. So much of this is about making work visible. Um, my university has a mentorship grant for when you're retooling. You know, NEH has a big one for retooling in terms of if you want to like, you know, get a different degree, get different training. But just, you know, setting up something so that you can go speak to somebody outside of your university. And of course, we can all do that by contacting people, but some people are better than others. And this, again, makes that work visible. Uh, my past university had ongoing research support so that if you had a project, you know, um, there were different phases at which you could apply for it for, from, um, you know, uh, hiring graduate students or indexer or the publication costs. Um, course buyout seems to have changed. Before course buyout costs, what a course buy, what it costs to have someone teach the course. Now it seems to be a percentage of your salary and all these things that you're like, that is now cost prohibitive for a lot of faculty members. Not having top off makes it, you know, reduces the incentive for people to want to apply for a fellowship. Um, Sometimes I get asked to be on a, you know, high profile uh, review committee board, this kind of thing. It may come with compensation. I need the time <laughs> that that is going to take. So if there's a way to translate that into cor uh, a course release is important. Um, the fact that the, the organization, the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity has done so well is a testament to what's missing at our universities. These, this is an organization where people are having these kinds of conversations on a more regular, ongoing basis. At my past university, we sponsored um, sponsorship for their summer boot camp, but we also had a parallel program at our university. 
so that we paired people with mentors. We got together and said, what kind of resources are you learning about there that we could emulate here, that we could put on the ground? Because one thing is to learn what's going on. Another thing is to apply it at our universities. So, you know, just, um, and, you know, as so many of us go into administration, department chairing, all these things, another area we're not trained in. What are ways that we can take the burden off of that kind of labor by, you know, making that labor more transparent through through coaching, through mentorship, through having space for conversation there? Because if we want to change the system, we also have to know how the, the system works. And we yet we don't want it to be so much of a burden that our work is just stopped in its tracks. I also wanted to share, I'm um, um, part of the inaugural cohort of the Research Leaders Academy at UT Austin, which is a bit tremendous so far. And it sort of takes that idea, Nathalia, to say, and I've learned so much from Nathalia, <laughs> like, uh, traveling to, use, you know, to, to her institutions, giving talks, and then, at, you know, asking, like, how do these institutions work? And her insight from her work in administration has been illuminating. Um, but to her point, you know, you shouldn't have to do so much administrative work just to figure out how to navigate, you know, the institutions and how to find ways to support your work or your teaching. Um, and so this research leadership academy is providing, you know, insights into the process, figuring out who are the people at the university in the different offices that can help you with the different kinds of grants, whether it's with foundations or federal grants. And, and I'm learning so much and it's so helpful. I mean, thinking, I mean, the course buyouts, you know, with the fringe on the top, it's astronomical in terms of costs. And so it is, um, I, I'm really grateful and I and and think that this is this is something that I had been wishing to have earlier. Um, and because it does take its time to build relationships with faculty across the university to see what's working in different units and colleges, and then how you might be able to build some of that infrastructure in your department or where you are. And um, so I think that this is um for me a sort of exciting model. Um, for supporting researchers who want to think collaboratively, who want to think about um, uh, building capacity at our own institutions, um, and and so that's one uh, that's one example that I'll share. Can I ask, um, Joy? So you are asking. You know, I was thinking about this. The question you asked about um, guidelines that professional organizations um, produce and. I don't know, it always struck me that um, I think it's important work. I guess I, the thing I'm never sure about is how it, to what extent it's like enforceable and to what extent, if it's not, if it's not really enforceable, then it still has this kind of chilling effect on junior scholars because, um, you know, we can have guidelines about how to evaluate digital publication or publishing data or all kinds of digital or collaborative work. Um, but it's so hard to predict, you know, just like where the rubber meets the road, like external peer, um, external, uh, evaluations for promotion and tenure or what the, what the, the, uh, provost committee on, <laughs> on promotion and tenure is going to say, no matter what the department says. Um, and so if there, if there's no way to enforce these things, then, it's going to, the, the junior faculty are still going to feel this, I mean, or one imagines um, junior faculty could feel a kind of sense of, um, yeah, conservatism, right? You don't want to stick your neck out too far and you, uh, and so then you end up doing it as like a second project or something like that, right? Which I think so many of us have done. You sort of do the safe thing first and then the second thing is the thing you sort of really want to do. Yeah, we hear, we hear this all the time, you know, that to wait till the second project. I, I would say that. Uh, this is certainly something that the uh, um, society uh, boards, executive directors uh, are deeply concerned about how to get the guidelines not only into the hands of faculty and, and evaluators, but um, but how to ensure they're being used and and uh, and applied in, in in hiring committees, promotion and tenure committees, and and then in the general you know, in the kind of water cooler conversation that they're part of the the furniture of our of our minds. 
Um, and it's something that they're, they're tackling, I think, in the best possible ways by just putting them out in front of any audience they can. And, and I'm doing it now on their behalf. And, and, um, and, uh, and we're having this panel or, you know, to in part, uh, give, give hope, uh, to the, to those, especially junior colleagues who are, who want to be, who want to push the envelope, however that's defined in their field or where they sit. Um, and also, but also honestly to, um, to exert some moral suasion and some intellectual pressure on in professional pressure on, um, on people who maybe haven't seen this as a problem who need to think about it as such. And on administrators who, um, who again, might not have thought that this is such a priority or connected to, um, to anything much important, that it's a fairly niche issue that it's really not, it's at the heart of what we do. Um, so, um, so I'm thinking actually of, um, and, and now looking, um, as I respond to you, uh, at, at a couple of the questions that, um, I see one about uh, aligning, uh, aligning with institutions. I'll get to that one in a minute. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about the question by, um, Alex Creighton that, um, that has to do with another, that I was thinking about this actually, Monica, as you were talking, uh, another, another angle here that, we also tend in academia when we see a problem to accrete to add on. So, you know, we, uh, and we hear this a lot at ACLS as well, that if we, we have to be careful, we're warned. And I really take this seriously that if we value a broader range of scholarship, that for any individual scholar, it will just lengthen the list of the things they have to have to be expert at. And of course, that's not at all the, the message we want to send. Um, but, but I'm, I'm very aware. I mean, it's a, it's a reasonable concern. I'm really aware of that. Um, so Alex is asking a question and he, he um, they, um, he, she, they, uh, uh, is asking, I'd love to hear the panelists thoughts on the strange and sometimes contradictory timing of academic reward structures, the ways in which graduate students are asked to plan out a whole trajectory, not allowing for the conversations, Natalia, you talked about not allowing for the evolution of thinking contingency. Um, but, and, but it's really the end of the question. How can we release the steam valve on, on this? How do we fight for, um, for more time? And, and all of you have talked about the gift of time and the gift of, um, of freedom from some of the pressures that, um, that get in the way of, of producing great work. Uh, do you have thoughts on that extremely difficult, but extremely good question about, um, the pressure that, one could say, and I'm often told this by especially emerging scholars, you know, new new PhDs, who say to us, who say to me, you know, you guys are making this system for us. How do you turn the steam valve up ah, in a good way? How do you release the, the pressure? In other words, avoid the add, you know, fight back against this add-on. Culture. It's a really tough one. <laughs> it is a tough one. Um, I'll just I'll just start talking and something will come. <laughs> but I think I think one thing that I always refer to is or that I always think about is making the work visible. Um, I think what works in my department is making that work visible. So we have structured in so many steps of what the grads with students go through, which is helpful for the grad students as well as for us. Um, we try to systematize what is usually left ad hoc to every committee. So a check-in, you know, after the first year, how's it going? What fields do you think you'll do? Who do you think you'll have on your committee? Um, a, you know, the then having those lists done, another meeting, you know, and so it means that it's a lot of work kind of upfront and regularly, you know, there's always, but it's in our calendar. Um, we have research clusters, there's funds, funds, <laughs> um, devoted to those research clusters to bring in a scholar to talk about these things. These are things that happen in every department, more or less, depending on you know, the, the, the mentor and the committee and all that, but it's trying to make visible and systematize so that people have the same opportunities. And recently what our teaching institute put forth was, um, um, a, a fellowship 
that somebody got like basically a TA ship for taking their their teaching institute um, over the semester. And then that also made them eligible to teach a summer course. We give funds, again, you know, funds are in short supply, <laughs> uh, funds for our graduate students starting the first year to go to our professional conference, whether or not they present, but just to be part of the conversation. So what are all the ways that we can make that visible? That doesn't mean that they're still not under all the pressure that everybody else is, right? I'm always like holding my breath as they're like, look, I got published in this, you know, thing that's, you know, not peer reviewed. And I'm like, how long did that take? Where's that that chapter? <laughs> right? Because I want you to finish because I know you need that when you go on the job market. So, you know, it, they're still operating uh, in the wider world, not in a vacuum. But anything that we can do to systematize, reward, make visible all the things that uh, graduate students, assistant professors, and then beyond, because how are you going to get promoted if there are no funds for our manuscript workshop for associate professors? You know, all these things continue to be important because at every phase, we know it's like we restart and we have to learn all these skills again and have all these conversations again. And I on Alex's question was, yeah, it was a little bit different. I think I, don't know, I, you know, I agree with what Talai has been saying. I mean, it seems like, I don't know, there's this box checking culture in a lot of, um, in a lot of academic work. And as long as we're stuck in this kind of box checking culture, the number of boxes are never going to decrease. They're always going to increase, right? So then you know, there's always going to be increased pressure on junior faculty to produce more and more. Um, in, in prescribed ways, like book one, book two, the way Alex described the quest, the posed the question. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think what we've, oh, and one theme that I've taken from this and is that, um, that way of, um, structuring, um, uh, our field, our disciplines is, counterproductive in a whole bunch of different ways and, it, and it's counterproductive in the way that Alex described that it becomes there is no room for organic growth that you're just so focused on um, pumping making words um, that will get published that you don't actually end up thinking about what you're doing while you're doing it I, I felt a lot I was fortunate maybe that I was in a, um, a university in a department where I didn't feel enormous pressure um, and I did actually think about what I was doing um, as I was an assistant professor, but yeah, I think it, I think that's also a function of my age, and I think it's um, things are only accelerating. And I and I don't know what to do about it except to say that like we should care about quality also, and not just quantity, <laughs> um, and we should care about things that don't fall into standard sizes. Um, but I don't know how how one goes about convincing other people that this is the way it ought to be. A part of it, I think, is is just having this conversation uh, and making it visible, which is again why we're doing this. And if and by the way, if that's if that was Alex, our Emerging Voices fellow, it's a shout out and a hello. Uh, I, I never want to assume when I see names that it's someone I know, but I think I do know this person. So thanks for the great question, Monica. Over to you. Just really want to quickly add that I, I hear um, the 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 worry for graduate students, and I, and I too worry for graduate students, and and also for assistant professors that feel the pressure not just to be so careful with the timeline for their publication. You know, of course, there's you know making you know, there's of course all the advice for for when to publish and and what to publish, and those should be ongoing conversations with graduate students and their chairs and their committees. Um, but but then there's a whole other conversation about um, what should be public and the pressure that I've heard from graduate students and from assistant professors about the need to have a social media following. And early conversations with editors at presses that ask how many Twitter followers they have, or whatever it's called now. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that, um, and to Nat Natalia's point, you know, especially for students who are working on 
important, critically important historical topics that might be considered controversial um, that that graduate students are stressed because they're feeling the pressure to both be a public, have a public um, presence um, and also worried about the risks of public exposure. And so I think that for all of the support that some universities are providing for things like op-ed training and writing and, 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 you know, I have sort of seen over my career, that shift from historians learning about op-eds. And then now, you know, everybody is like really contributing to the public conversation through op-eds, um, but not enough media training and media uh, savvy, you know, training for for academics. And so we're learning particular skills, but then not learning the rest of the skills that are required. Um, and so, so access to media training at universities for graduate students, I think, is an important part. And then, and also for presses, you know, that are pushing academics to be public, to be on social media. Um, I was uh, very fortunate to have an editor, um, Kathleen McDermott at Harvard, for my first book that was like, you know, maybe we should have general counsel read some of these sections. And I thought I would never have, you know, thought to do that. But thank you. And they actually had some really important recommendations. So, you know, we are having as as public facing scholars or scholars that are speaking to public audiences or whose work is reaching audiences outside of just traditional classrooms. Um, it is requiring that that we are are smart and savvy. And so for graduate students, I I always recommend slow. <laughs> like they're, you know, that sort of I worry when graduate students are thinking about the news cycles, um, and 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 I would also say to 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 back to Dimitri's point about you know checking boxes and what graduate students feel like are the boxes they need to check, um, and I'll also say that for re the reward structure um, within departments, you know, at my different institutions and in different academic conversations, you know, I've heard some some colleagues say like you know I don't do that work. And I don't want it to be something that I'm reviewed on or that it looks like an absence on my, you know, annual review or my merit, you know, form that I fill out. And so for some faculty, we're like, where can I just add an extra box and I write an other <laughs> like add to the form um, for metrics or for annual reviews? And there are and there are some colleagues who say, I don't want anything added because I don't do that. And so it, I don't want an, an empty box on my review form. And those are, I think, to come back to, to some of the earlier points about, you know, the sort of uh, uh, strategic plans of a university that are thinking about impact and public impact. And then the conversations that have to happen at the departmental level to think about, well, what do we, how do we measure impact as as a as an intellectual community within this university? May I add one moment of levity to this? Uh, when I published an op-ed on immigration in the LA Times, which my mom reads, she said, oh, and I read your other two pieces. I'm like, what? You know, that, you know, that week I said, what? It was the hate mail I got in the LA T Times about my op-ed on immigration. So yes, there's a pushback, but hey, it brought my mom joy just to see the name there. <laughs> It is. I, I mean, all of this, um, and then I know we only have a, a few minutes left. I mean, it does speak to one of the ways in which the system is a system, and that's the ways in which all of this is interconnected. And I just want to bring this out. Um, um, it's something uh, our, our Emerging Voices Fellowship Fellows Colloquium discusses. Um, it's something we talk about all the time here at ACLS, um, how when we push a button or pull a lever, um, on one piece of the of the of the career, think of it that way. On one one um, element of the of any scholar's career trajectory, uh, we're affecting other parts of it. And so, um, I'll, I'll say, for example, we have a um, thanks to the Mellon Foundation and its generous support, we have a dissertation innovation fellowship. Um, now, uh, the successor program to a longstanding program uh, that, that awarded a, a year at the end of the dissertation process, this new program, which started last year, um, gives students um, right of, around the dissertation proposal stage uh, an opportunity to add a year of funding to their graduate experience, their doctoral experience, gaining experience in a, in a different field, learning new methods, developing a critical stance, and really doing great stuff. Again, it's called the Dissertation Innovation Fellowship. Tell, tell all your uh, dissertating or about to dissertate friends and students about it. 
Um, but the, but the, the, if when we get questions about it that have a critical edge, that has everything to do um, with faculty wanting to protect students and 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 make you know ensure that they have the best possible future. They say to us, you know, careful because if we're supporting work that isn't going to get these amazing students jobs or isn't going to get them tenure down the road, you know, that's not right. That's not fair to them. And that's why we're, you know, we're doing things like this, having conversations that, um, that awaken people to the passion and excitement and brilliance that um, not just, you know, emerging scholars in, in graduate school, but at every stage of career and all kinds of sectors um, are what they're bringing to their work, what they're achieving um, and the and the frustrations and and pain uh, that they feel and the way in which we all lose when that incredibly interesting, valuable, deeply meaningful, important work um, doesn't get as you've all the word you've all used the visibility, the recognition, the reward it deserves. So, um, so I I want to thank you. I feel like we could have have talked for uh, for you know another couple of hours and answered. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. I'll flag one really interesting one about community-engaged research and emerging in um, newer interdisciplinary disciplines and especially in studies of race, race and ethnicity. I think that's absolutely on target. I think that's right. There is This is not coincidental that methods that get viewed with suspicion um, tend to emerge in the study of historically ignored and erased groups um, or collocations that have been ignored in scholarship. Just one example of a great question. Um, I want to end by thanking our, our three uh, discussants Keep doing the amazing work you're doing and and just know that you are a model. Uh, I don't want to put a weight on all of you, but you are really a model of excellence and and commitment and 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 savvy for all of us. So thank you all so much. And uh, we wish you the best. And thank you all in the audience um, for, for coming. Thank you again. I hope I see you all in person soon. <laughs>